Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today we're looking at a video in a series called Origins on the channel Cornerstone Television Network. In this video on Origins, we are about to discuss what they claim is the most asked question about Christianity. I wonder what that question will be. Let's find out! During this program, we showcase interesting guests who present evidence from science along with other important facts validating the truth of creation and the accuracy of the Bible. And there we go, giving away the bias right there in the opening statement of what your show is about. Okay, do you want to know what I do on my channel? I examine religious claims, usually young earth creationist ones, to see if there is any truth to them. I'm not going to pretend to not be biased, but I am open to having my mind changed. And you can actually see some issues where I have changed my mind. I have videos still up on my channel where I discuss how Genesis probably wasn't meant to be taken literally because it's a poem. But then I spoke with Dr. Joshua Bowen, who studied Biblical Hebrew, and he convinced me that Genesis is most likely not actually a poem, but is prose with some components that are sometimes considered poetic but probably weren't in Genesis. I am open to having my mind changed, but I have yet to see a convincing argument from young earth creationism, while every time I learn something new about evolution, the whole thing seems to make a bit more sense. What are we talking about today? The problem of evil. The problem of evil. I've heard that's the Achilles heel of Christianity. Not really. It's an easy enough question to answer from a Christian perspective when talking to other Christians who already believe in the existence of God in the first place. God allows evil because it's part of his plan that will ultimately bring about more good than evil in the long run, if only we could see the whole picture, but our minds are too small to comprehend the awesome magnificence of his plan. This sort of answer is usually enough for someone that already believes that such a God exists, but atheists will probably not be convinced by that. Well, I actually think uh, this subject, which is, believe it or not, in my 25 years of ministry, this is the most asked question, not by skeptics, but by Christians. By Christians. Yeah, I'd believe that. In my experience, the answers to this question are most definitely geared toward people who already believe in a god, and it's probably a question that was asked by skeptics while they were Christian but on their way out, and the unsatisfactory answer to this question can sometimes be a contributing factor. But once you're out, the existence of pain and suffering is perfectly understandable in the absence of a god. By Christians, why does a good god allow all the death and suffering in the world. And far from being the Achilles heels, I found when I deal with this subject head on, it's the most powerful presentation of the gospel we can make. It provides the answer uh, to why actually Jesus came. Jesus came because God screwed up. He made a world that was flawed and had problems that humans describe as evil, so he had to send Jesus to fix the problem. And the solution that he offered isn't really that great of a solution either. Instead of reducing suffering in this life, he set up a system where people who spend their life suffering but aren't convinced of or never hear of the resurrection story continue their suffering for all eternity in the afterlife. This isn't a great solution to a problem that shouldn't have existed in the first place. So let's start, you know, John 16, 33, the Lord Jesus turned around and says, I have told you these things in this world, you will have trouble. How prophetic and wise, Jesus figured out that everyone will have trouble in their lives. Life isn't perfect for anyone, ever, and everyone knows this. Now certainly the kinds of trouble people experience are varied, and often economic factors will drastically change the nature of the problems faced, but it is a fact that everyone has problems. And I've kind of distilled the problems down to two areas, if you like. You and every other apologist out there. Natural evil and human-caused evil, right? Define them. There are these natural world disasters. You know, we see tsunamis and earthquakes. And we say, well, you know, if God's creator is in control, you know, he could have done something about this. Damn straight. He could have made a world that doesn't have earthquakes or tsunamis or designed the universe in such a way as to make large scale disasters just a physical impossibility. He didn't have to create disease. He didn't need to make whole categories of organisms where a part of their life cycle involves living inside another organism using that organism's resources to the extreme detriment of the host organism. He didn't have to make reproduction such a primal urge that organisms will, if left to their own devices, reproduce to the point where they will take up all the available resources and starve back to a point where there's enough for those that are left. 
He could have given animals an innate sense of the caring capacity of their environment so that they wouldn't reproduce beyond it. But no, he chose instead to make the world that we see that shows every indication of having not been designed by any thinking being. And we see terrible things. And we have to be careful also as Christians and creationists. We love to use that passage in Romans 1.20 where it says, you know, we can see God from what has been made. Well, we can, mm -hmm. but we also need to understand we're looking at a fallen world. In other words, if it's pretty and nice, God gets the credit. But if it's horrifying and disturbing, that's humanity's fault. If Eve hadn't eaten the fruit that God made as a make everything go to shit button, then God would never have been forced into making the earth geologically active or designing organisms that rely on parasitism to survive. Now, yeah, I know being geologically active is an important part of why the earth is habitable in the first place, though most of the reasons for that center around the earth being billions of years old, but it does make Make you wonder, would there have been earthquakes and volcanoes had the fruit not been eaten? How was God protecting life from the ionizing radiation put out by the sun if not for the magnetic field caused by our spinning molten core? Was spinning up the core and cracking the surface of the earth into tectonic plates part of the curse that God placed on Adam and Eve? where death and suffering reigns. A animals tear each other apart in Africa, so... Animals tear each other apart on every continent, buddy, including Antarctica. Africa is just where some of the most well-known predators live. But here's the point, right? Whether we're looking at natural world disasters or man-inflicted disasters, like, you know, the Twin Towers, they both have the same root cause, and that is sin. What do you know? Stealing from a convenience store is caused by the same thing as earthquakes. Did someone tell the geologists? Sin. Yeah, well, okay, we can understand a man is sinful and he might commit acts of terrorism. But you know, when we go back to Genesis, it wasn't just Adam and Eve that was cursed. Human beings, we read the ground was cursed. Yeah, but when we look at that verse in context, it's talking about how hard it is to grow things. You need to work for it, weeding and tending the garden constantly. It is clearly not talking about geological features like tectonic plates or volcanoes. The plants were cursed, the animals were cursed. See, we live in a cursed and fallen world. Isn't God supposed to be the incarnation of perfect justice? How is it just to curse all of the animals because of the actions of one species? And what about all the organisms that engage in one form or another of parasitism? How did they exist before the fall? There are a lot of organisms from fungi to wasps that rely on being parasites for a part of their life cycle. Did the wasps that lay eggs inside of living but paralyzed caterpillars just not do that until humans ate the fruit? Why would a human eating a fruit affect their life cycle in such a manner? There are so many aspects of the world that show a clear lack of compassion on the designer that cannot be directly attributed to human action. God would have had to go through his creation and redesign everything after the fall to make it a painful world full of suffering. That shows malice, and it's not a good look. The New Testament tells us the whole creation is groaning and travailing under the weight of sin. Yeah, it does, but why the whole creation? Why not just the ones who committed the sin? God's going to create a new heavens and earth. Why? Because this one is actually corrupted. Which brings up another problem. Usually the way the earth was corrupted is explained as being the result of free will, and yet somehow this new heaven and new earth will be incorruptible. Which means that if it was free will that caused the corruption of the earth in the first place, then free will will be removed from us in the next one. Unless it is actually possible for God to design a system that has free will and is incorruptible, which, if that were possible, means that the system he designed first was not perfect as it was corruptible. And it ultimately gets back to our worldview. Sadly, too many Christians look at death and disease in the world and say, well, that's normal. Well, normal is the typical state or condition of something. And even by a young earth creationist perspective, it is usually agreed that there wasn't a lot of time in between creation and the fall. So it's maybe a few months if we stretch it out compared to the 6,000 years that they believe the earth has been around. Meaning that the typical state or condition of the world is as a fallen world. So by definition, no matter what your worldview is, death, suffering, disease, natural disasters and the like are the norm. But that wasn't the way God created. If God created a perfect world, these things are a problem. They're an entrance as a result of sin. But if the world were truly perfect, 
Would the entrance of imperfections even be possible? I would not consider something perfect if it has built within it a mechanism to ruin the whole thing for everyone. If someone were to program the perfect operating system that uses system resources at peak efficiency all the time, never crashes, and is easy for everyone to use no matter their level of experience, would we still call it perfect if it came with an undeletable icon on the desktop front and center that, should you click it, replaces itself with Windows ME? That seems like a serious design flaw to me, drastically reducing any claim of perfect design. Now, here's the issue. Ideas have consequences. If we start accepting and say, well, why did God create a world with death? Well, he didn't. But if we start to think that, then we start to think of him being a cruel and capricious creator. And that's generally the, what the skeptics kind of target us with. Okay, so let's assume for argument's sake that God did not create the world with death. The Bible never actually says that. In fact, it makes it clear that the reason Adam is kicked out of Eden is to remove his access to the tree of life, indicating that death actually was a thing, but eating from the tree of life could hold it off. If that is not the case, then the tree of life literally serves no purpose and should never have been made. But if God created the world with no death, then that means that God invented death as a result of Adam and Eve eating the fruit, inflicting it as a punishment on the whole of creation for the actions of one tiny part of creation. So either God created the world with death in the beginning and so was malicious, or God created death as a punishment for everything in creation in a malicious act of vengeance against Adam and Eve. Either way, God looks malicious in this story. And also, Ideas have consequences for those outside the church. Yeah, now he's going to talk about a school shooter that had a manifesto where he described himself as the natural selector in an attempt to blame evolutionary thinking for bad actions, because ideas have consequences. But I'm skipping this. There are a number of reasons why it is completely irrelevant. Chief among them is that this is simply an argument from consequences. Whether or not evolutionary thinking leads to violent actions, evolution still happens. But we're not really talking about evolution, this video is supposed to be on the problem of evil. So to the point, God has had the ability to stop every single evil action by every human being in history. He has been present for every one of these actions watching. We send people to prison for being present at crimes, having the knowledge and ability to stop the crime, but failing to do so. That's called being an accessory. If God exists, he is an accessory to every crime in human history. So we are teaching in school, in public education, that man is just an animal. So why, you know, be nice to one another? No, we aren't teaching that humanity is just an animal. The just there is important. We are animals, remarkable animals, but still animals. There's nothing wrong with being an animal. That's just the kingdom of life we fit into. If you feed on organic matter, have sensory organs, and respond rapidly to stimuli, then you are an animal. And then to follow up the just an animal with the question, why be kind to one another, is quite telling. If you don't see a reason to be kind to animals, then that says a lot about you. And if you do see reason to be kind to animals, then you probably don't need me to explain why being kind to other human animals is also important. And of course, Darwin in his famous book, uh, Origin of Species, he wrote, thus from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object which we are capable of conceiving, namely the production of higher animals, man, directly follows. While we yeah, death and scarcity of resources are behind most selection pressures. That is from the very last paragraph in his book, so he has literally just spent an entire book explaining why that is the case, and this is his summary for the conclusion of his book. But you're supposed to be dealing with the problem of evil, remember? Right now you're explaining how death and suffering and disease make perfect sense in a godless world where speciation is driven by evolution. We see death and suffering all over the natural world. Death and suffering play roles in the evolutionary process, so it makes sense that this process can be extrapolated into the past. You are trying to claim that it's all the result of the actions of an all-loving, all-powerful God. So in your view, it's the loving God that put into motion the war of nature with famine and death that Darwin is talking about. Will he adequately explain the existence of evil in a worldview where God exists who would be able to eliminate all evil on a whim? To find out, tune in tomorrow, same Rhino time, same Rhino channel.